but not only in diabetic patients. It's also present in patients following myocardial expansion, following unstable angina, so, but most commonly is in diabetic patients. So, moving from that thing, uh, statistical facts about uh, myocardial ischemia and the cardiac in general. So far, in 2004, still cardiac disease or cardiovascular disease are causing 44% of all deaths. And despite the improvement in treatment, cardiovascular will continue to kill more people than any other cause. And this paradoxical fact is related to the fact that the bulk of our therapists are targeting symptomatic patients. We have advancement in the management, but still we have more deaths from cardiac disease. And this slide is very interesting to me to show you that the solid part here is the asymptomatic patients, uh, or asymptomatic episodes of ischemia, and the light part is the one with symptoms there. You can see that when we are doing exercise, the reference is almost equivalent there. But when you see we are, we are sleeping, or some patients while sleeping, the instance of asymptomatic ischemia is very hard during rest also, during eating, during driving. So this just gives you an ever overview that the presence of sign of myocardial ischemia is quite common. When we come to the metrics, 85 to uh, the diabetic patients are type 2, these are statistical facts, 55% of these patients are having ischemic heart disease, and 60% of those patients are presenting with sign of ischemia. 70% of diabetics die from cardiovascular disease. And the diabetic patients have more extensive atherosclerosis, higher prevalence of multifacetary artery disease, and all these things when compared with non diabetic patients. Again, when they do autopsy, 75% of diabetics without clinical evidence during their life of coronary artery disease, they would have coronary atherosclerosis at autopsy. And this is a Feminine study, uh, 30 years follow-up of patients who have an unrecognized myocardial infarction, half of them with no symptoms, showing that the prevalence of ischemia is in men and women with the age, it's increasing in the age with age, and you can see that half of those people are having no symptoms. So Again, in the past three decades, there is marked decline in the mortality related to coronary artery disease all over, all over the population. However, when we come to the diabetes, the story is a little bit different. Maybe. In non-diabetic men, 36% decline in cardiovascular mortality compared to 13% only in diabetic men. In women, they are a little bit bad luck in that area because in non-diabetic women, 27% decline in cardiovascular mortality during the past three decades. While in the erratic women, there is increase in the mortality by 23%, not decrease like in uh, male patients. When we come to the prognosis, patients who have no history of coronary heart disease by any means, 4% of healthy asymptomatic people are having significant coronary heart disease. 10% asymptomatic men with more than two risk factors, with uh, asymptomatic men with more than two major risk factors that I mean, like atherosclerosis, obesity, and smoking, uh, will have, uh, the of them will have ischemia. When we have the same factors here, but we add to them diabetes, then we will see that the, the disease is there, and also the uh, severity of the disease is very high. Three fatal disease in 33%, diffuse disease in 55%, fatal occlusion in 31% versus this low percentage and those who are non diabetic patients. And now, the prognosis of silent myocardial ischemia is also correlated to the type of treatment in those patients. And different studies have been showing during the follow up of those patients what is the optimal way of managing those patients. And you can see here, when we are lying on the symptoms only, so the and the, the percentage of what we call the major adverse cardiac events like mortality of myocardial function are quite high. When we are using on the, uh, when we are uh, depending on the symptoms, when we are depending on the objective evidence of ischemia by uh, echo or by uh, spec, 
and treating the patient accordingly, the percentage is going down to 8%. But when we do revascularization, then the percentage will go down to 47%. So those uh, modalities, uh, this, these lines will follow up of those patients to show the effect of treatment uh, in relation to the prognostic factors or the, in relation to the major adverse cardiac events needs follow up by different imaging modalities. And accordingly, there are two major arms for cardiac imaging. Either the anatomical imaging, to see the atherosclerosis by current antenna using ultrasound, calcium scoring, or CT angiography, which is very popular nowadays. Or seeing the physiological consequences of the atherosclerosis by stress echo, which is very popular in the stress echo, and the myocardial diffusion imaging. Current antenna. It's a bedside simple test, and it's known as a surrogate marker for subclinical coronary artery disease because it's the kind of a reflection of the burden of atherosclerosis in the patients, and the studies show that it's increased in diabetic patients. The, pro the progression of cardiac antima, atherosclerosis was 25% greater in diabetes disease compared to non-diabetics. However, we have a problem that these Protocols are not standardized. Different methods for measuring cardiac arterial thickness, and there is no widely accepted age gender gender reference range. And again, it's operator dependent. Accordingly, it's not the ideal to follow up cyanide ischemia. When we come to calcium scoring, it's closely related to the coronary atherosclerotic burden, and many studies show that coronary artery calcium scoring predict the incident of coronary artery disease. Now, with this uh, publication on 900 diabetic patients compared to 9,000 non-diabetic patients uh, of low and intermediate clinical risk of coronary artery disease, they found that diabetics with no detectable coronary calcium score have excellent prognosis similar to non-diabetics. So in fact, when the calcium score is showing uh, low levels, let us say, you know, 100, whether the patient is diabetic or non-diabetic, you will see that the five-year survival is almost similar. While the mortality asymptomatic diabetics increase in proportion to the baseline calcium scoring. When we have asymptomatic patients with high calcium scores, then the mortality starts to increase. In a different study on 270 diabetic patients compared to 1,000 non-diabetic patients, they found that the prognostic value of coronary artery calcium score was weaker in diabetics when compared to non-diabetics. So this is a conflicting article compared to the other one. Accordingly, these conflicting findings reduced the value of the coronary calcium scoring in the follow-up of cyanide ischemia. Now we come to the third anatomical imaging modality for ischemia, which is the CTA, or the computerized tomography and geography. The diagnostic accuracy is high. However, because it's purely anatomical, so the ability to stratify the risk of the patients is a little bit good. And the comparative studies between the CTA and the SPECT showed that the overall two-year mortality was similar on those patients. In this study, when the CTA showed the stenosis less than 50%, the survival was almost 100%. When the stenosis is more than 50%, and especially in the left knee, then the stenosis, uh, the survival is reduced to 85%. When we come to Spain, we see that 100% survival for normal uh, Spain studies. And when they prove that 50% of symptomatic patients are a will go for revascularization, while only a quarter of the patients will go for revascularization. That's why the morbidity and mortality for those patients who are having myocardial ischemia, ischemia is higher compared to symptomatic ischemia, because we usually treat patients who are complaining. And that's in the uh, article also, the figure they show that the difference between uh, angina and no angina through the years, that the probability of survival is much lower when the patient is not 
privatizing. And even also the prevalence is almost three times for no angina compared to angina. Again, the worst prognosis was when you have no angina and multiple physical reality disease, that's this curve here. You can see the survival is dropping significantly compared to when you have an uh, uh, angina with multiple physical cardiac disease, those patients usually will go, 50% of them will go for revascularization. And you can see that there is a big difference here between uh, uh, three, the capital mild three compared to four, while the, the other two are all close to each other. So these two groups, despite that both of them are multi physical rankings, but the prognosis is completely different when you have symptoms versus no symptoms. However, there are very important limitations and features also of stress echo in those patients that can identify high risk diabetic, diabetic diseases. Uh, when it's the most literary event is around 7% and 5 years. Uh, stress echo with ischemia in 2 to 3 triplets is 32% and 5 years. However, when we have normal stress echo, it's not reassuring. It's not like the Italian or not like the Spanish. Annual event rate is 1.5 to 6% in diabetics when we have normal stress echo versus 0.6 to 2.7 in non diabetics. So, of course, uh, uh, this is the annual death rate, uh, at the annual death rate or annual event rate I mean, in those patients. And the event rate rises sharply after that. You start by normal stress echo, but then you find at this, after two years that the percentage is high, very high, and high. And the important feature that the stem is operated and also center related uh, experience when it comes to stress echo. So, not, not all the centers are expert in the stress echo. 5 to 20% will have some optimal stress echo because of the poor acoustic window, inadequate exercise, and uh, poor chromatomic response to the vitamin uh, injection. Accordingly, the warranty period of normal stress echo is less defined in the patients. Coming to uh, our nuclear uh, cancer study, which is the, the SPECT, and adding to it uh, what we took together said in this presentation about the DSPEC, the high definition spec, you will see how the role is a very uh, popular for detecting the objective evidence of silent mycelium scheme. I'll just go through uh, this slide quickly here. The risk adjusted event free survival is correlated very high to the stress, to the sun stress score. And it was found that it's worse in diabetes compared to diabetes. Women with diabetes have the worst outcome for any given extent of the rest of the scheme. And in this uh, group, on the study of 700 diabetes patients, they found that when you add also the gated spent bar, by the way, together, uh, together, and the, the D spent and the high definition spent, we still also can do the gated spent with them. Even with a small camera, yes. we can still move the camera the gate spec. So that's again uh, one of the things which is in our because it is uh simulation. Excellent, yeah. Even also in this short time of three minutes. Yeah, I mean it is less Okay. So again we are not losing that much by applying the new technology now with this short time. You will also have the data on the functional ejection fraction in addition to the microbial perfusion, perfusion, and when you add both of them, the ejection fraction and the sum stress score, you will find that the prediction of cardiac death is uh, getting higher and higher. You, you use, you total, you use the same routine? Uh, as the, uh, the normal gamma camera. Yeah, either like or the other box. Yes. So the same procedure for processing it is applied. That's very good. So, spent inside my kind of ischemia, when we come to the prognosis, we all know that normal spent is having a benign prognosis, but normal spent uh, means a worse prognosis, around 7% of major cardiac event rates. Mildly abnormal spent uh, is a very important category here because very low mortality and high risk of my cardiac function. And many studies report the same pattern in diabetes. So, it's almost the same for non diabetics and diabetic patients. 
And now when we come to the diabetic patient, you see that the number of studies comparing diabetics to non-diabetics using the spec or the metallic diffusion imaging is quite higher than the stress echo. So spec in asymptomatic diabetics, the annual uh, measure that we have events, when we have normal spec, it's not any more less than 1%. Here it's 2%. And at normal spec, it's not 7%. Here in the diabetes, it's 9%. So we are always having this high risk with diabetic patients compared to non diabetics, even when we have a low spec. And, and this study on 700 diabetic patients, asymptomatic diabetes, uh, asymptomatic diabetics are having 40% uh, of normal spec. And when we have symptomatic diabetics, it's not that much higher. We are expecting that we are going to have more here, but that gives you an idea that diabetic patients are always having this preference of high uh, 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 probability of having ischemia irrespective of the symptoms. <coughs> this is a huge study uh, on 27,000 patients where almost 5,000 of them are diabetics and they found that asymptomatic diabetics are having 58% of them are having abnormal spec again. Symptomatic diabetics are almost the same 59% abnormal spec. So it's again stressing the idea that whether you have symptoms or no symptoms, you will find that this, the prevalence of having coronary artery disease is high on those diabetic patients. And the major uh, adverse cardiac events like cardiac death or myocardial infarction when we have a low risk spec, it's almost 4%, intermediate risk spec, and of course, we have low risk and high risk are all related to that. I'm not going to go into details about the size of the effect, uh, the degree of reversibility, uh, the features of the lung uptake, the multi-visit one after disease, the constant stability, the dilatation. I think uh, uh, most of you know these kind of features in the spec. So that's why we want to go low risk spec and intermediate risk and high risk spec, and all is uh, very highly correlated to the prognosis of silent skin. And that's a case example of a normal case where you have the normal bicardial diffusion and the normal function, and again you have moderate effects in one single artery, and then you have a kind of a severe effect. So those are all translated into the prognosis for those patients. Now, in general, diabetics have a two-fold higher current events compared to non-diabetics. 4.3% compared to 2.3%. That's in general. And in Hakimovic, in his uh, 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 number uh, two publication, and he's the one who did a lot of studies on the prognosis using myocardial diffusion energy, he stated that normal myocardial diffusion is less reassuring in diabetics than in non-diabetics. And he said that uh, there is what we call a limited warranty period of only two years at maximum. And that's in his study showing that the, the, during the follow up of two years, this is the time where you can give only the warranty up to two years. But after two years, then you will start saying that the normal diffusion and non diabetics is better compared to normal diffusion diabetic patient. That's why he said at maximum two years at the cutoff point for warranty of normal spec in diabetic patients. There are some specific indicators, a specific type of silent ischemia which are occurring in patients different than the uh, classic diabetics, which are a silent ischemia after a fluid myocardial infarction. Usually, most patients before discharge, you would go at MSM within two to four days, and if we have negative spec, then there is no event A. If we have negative uh, submaximal exercise by ECG alone without doing a spec, the event rate is 22%. So in fact, we do need to do spec for those patients before discharge. In patients with moderate to severe defects, and that's another indication definitely because the predictors of prognosis are very high now when we do the spec study by seeing the very important ischemia, the remote ischemia, extensive infarction more than 10%. All these factors denote bad prognosis and calls for revascularization. So those patients after acute myocardial infarction, diabetic patients after acute myocardial infarction, it becomes like an indication to do spec before discharge. Also, diabetic patients who are having unstable angina or uh, uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction, they are uh, in uh, stemming, 
should be classified first by taking clinical scoring. And if we have moderate and high risk group, then they will go directly to a CAT and BCI. That's the stable angina patient. If they are low risk by the TAPI scoring, then we will, we will go for non invasive spectral imaging for, fur for further risk stratification. And then that's where the tank is in uh, the journal of the The adversary spec can show either the person defects and that will uh, force the treating physician to push those patients to revascularization or to show all the person defects and the calling those patients can go for medical management. So in fact, even in unstable angina, if we deal with the thing in combination of clinical data with the additive data of the spec, then we are going to uh, have proper management for the patients. And this is a silent ischemia in uh, diabetic patients after uh, uh, any uh, non ischemic myocardial infarction, showing the reversibility in the LED territory. According to this patient, should go for revascularization. Now, there is something called the American Diabetes Association guidelines for follow up of patients, of diabetic patients. Should we go for spec or not? The American guidelines are shown and say that we know that 60% of our patients are going to have ischemic heart disease. However, we are saying that if we have ischemia on, uh, I mean, we are thinking about asymptomatic diabetes now, we will do all these tests, spectrum or echo, in the following indication. That's the American Diabetes Association. Only if we have ischemia on the, on the ECG, or we have abnormal ECG but not ischemia, or we have mildly positive treadmill or association of other risk factors. So those are by their criteria is the only indication to do stress echo or space. Now, in 2004, this famous study was published by Franz Walter Group, and it was it's called detection of uh, asymptomatic detection of skin and asymptomatic diabetes. And they studied 1,000 diabetic, more than 1,000 diabetic patients with no known or suspected coronary artery disease, randomly assigned to two modalities. It's a kind of uh, double blind level A evidence. And they, the patients were done uh, spent and five years clinical follow up or only clinical follow up. And they found that 22% had silent ischemia by spent, and 6% of those patients are having moderate to large diffusion defects. So, now, taking this study in consideration, selecting only patients who met the American Diabetes Association guidelines would have failed to identify 41% of patients with silent ischemia. So I think the point here is going more that we should take diabetic patients in a more serious way by following them up, um, or at least doing an initial study or every two years, a spec study or a stress level for those patients. Accordingly, this thing can a little bit simplify what I have said in uh, the previous slides that if you have a, 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 a diabetic patient and you do a spent study or my color diffusion imaging study, if you have a normal study, it is uh, better to follow those patients every year because, as I said, the maximum warranty is only two years. But if you can follow them every, two, every year, that would be a uh, problem. And then now, uh, if you have an abnormal study, Mild abnormality, then you will go for medical treatment and do it also again for up every year. If you have moderate to severe abnormality, then you have to go further for chronic angio uh, and follow medical restoration or PCI. So, to conclude, it is the ischemia more than the symptom that determines the proposal. So, that's a very important thing. Silent ischemia is more common, so its detection is important, especially in high risk population. Monitoring for silent ischemia should identify the diabetic patients who require more aggressive treatment and allow intervention before catastrophic events such as myocardial infarction or cardiac death, especially in women. Reversible silent ischemia appears the most powerful independent predictor for cardiac events when we have a reversible silent ischemia by myocardial perfusion engine. Monitoring of completely asymptomatic diabetic, diabetics, uh, diabetic patients will likely never be cost effective. We cannot go and screen everybody 
to uh, by doing uh, by further diffusion However, targeting higher risk diabetics would benefit from more aggressive medical or interventional therapy. Recommendations are more toward animal specs or tricycle and diabetics with more than two risk factors. And the warranty period, I mean, two risk factors in addition to the diabetes. The risk factors, as we all know, are the obesity, asthma sclerosis, smoking, and the family history. So if we have more than two risk factors, the recommendations are going more with annual respect or stress level. The warranty period is less defined and ranges from one year to maximum two years depending on the study type, whether it's stress level or respect, and depending also on the patient's factors. Thank you.